All right, so we'll be talking about really the more pure international style modernist movement that had its origins in Europe. So we'll talk about in this slideshow the, the origins of the modernist movement in Europe and then how that translates to the United States in our next lectures. And we'll talk about, this is the great Mies van der Rohe Barcelona Pavilion, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. So I made some allusions when we were talking about the Art Nouveau to World War I. Um, as most of you, if you were paying attention in your high school history, uh, World War I started in uh, 1914 in Europe. America finally entered in 1917, um, I think. Um, and this you know, was a horrific war, unlike anything the world had ever seen. Um, wasn't even called World War One back then. It was the Great War back then, because of course nobody had any clue that there would be yet another one that was even worse twenty years later. Um, but it it was a, a war that in completely engulfed all of Europe. You know, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, France, England, uh, Germany, Russia destroyed. It, so it destroyed the Tsarist uh, system, Empire of Russia. It destroyed the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, it destroyed um, the monarchy of Germany. Um, and, you know, France and England uh, emerged victorious out of it. it Italy was involved. Um, they were on the Allied side, you know, fighting with France and England in that war. Um, but uh, it, it was really destructive. It wiped out almost an entire generation of young men uh, who were fighting in the war in the trenches and so forth. And that trench warfare was, was more horrific than anyone could imagine. You know, it, it, they, the, and the mechanization, you know, the Industrial Revolution, which had created a lot of the things we've talked about that allowed great works of architecture and so forth, also created... Um, you know, implements of war that had never been seen before, tanks and airplanes and, you know, powerful artillery, um, gas, you know, gas warfare that just was horrific. And so that really destroyed this roman these romantic notions that had emerged in the arts and crafts movement, in the Art Nouveau movement, you know beauty and nature and you know this this romantic era of the medieval craftsman working you know on a farm with his hands all of those sort of you know they were they weren't very real when they were sort of reimagined during these movements but um you know the horrors of the war um, were such that it that, that it shook everything to its its core and its foundation and so uh it it essentially destroyed the arts and crafts movement, the Art Nouveau movement, the Prairie School movement, you know, even in the United States, which of course didn't face the horror war on its own soil. And really our casualties were nowhere near what, what the Europeans experienced, but it's still, it just fundamentally changed um, the world. And out of that, eventually would emerge um, the, the modernist movement um, and really out of the ruins of Germany, which lost the war and uh, were, was completely transformed. Um, we, we saw these, this, these architects, these artists and creative people saying, what, what, can, what can a new world be, right? You know, out of the horrors, out of the destruction, what can, what can something new be? And um, uh, we really start to see what uh, architects became, began to see architecture as a, quote, machine for living. Uh, it, ironically, they embrace the, the Industrial Revolution, which had been, you know, added so much to the destruction of the war. Um, but they said, you know what, we're living in the 20th century and the industries and the mechanization is here. Um, and this romantic notions that people had 20 years ago just don't make any sense anymore. And so we really see a full embrace in Europe, especially of the industrialization, the machinery, the, the, the how can we use that for, for bettering people though, you know, in a, in a positive way. And architecture really became um, known as something with the zeitgeist. Um, the zeitgeist is the idea that, um, that architecture and art ought to be of its time and its place, that we should not be looking back. You know, if the arts and crafts of uh, practitioners were sort of at least inspired by medieval forms and shapes and so forth. Um, they thought, no, we, you know, architecture should 
if, if we're living in a mechanical age and in an industrial age, the architecture should reflect that. That's the zeitgeist of the architecture. So you'll often hear zeitgeist used even in today's world, and it's and it applies to something more contemporary. Of course, we live in a computer age. So should architecture reflect the computerization of our world? That's what zeitgeist means. Uh, and it first really emerges as a as a philosophy here in the 1920s in the post World War One era. And the other thing is that um, this this movement. Uh, really saw uh, the idea of how can we transform society and use architecture and art and planning and other aspects, uh, related fields, but how can we use architecture as a force for social change? And out of that comes some good and some bad. Um, you know, to, to no, no question that um, the cities of the Industrial Revolution, they were dirty, they were crowded, they were, you know, they had slum housing, tenement slum housing that uh, wasn't hardly fit for living. Um, people were stacked in and in multiple multiple generations of families in tiny little apartments and all that, uh, with no running water or no good, you know, sewer systems and all that. So, so in many ways, the early movement said, "Hey, how can we transform our cities into something that will make life better for people?" including working class people and not just the wealthy elite. Um, but then also it failed, as we'll talk in a, in a future lecture and we get into the 20th century in America and the urban planning, uh, urban renewal movements of the 1950s and 60s. Um, that philosophy was there. How can, you know, how can we you know, wipe out the slums and build modernist housing for people? And that turned into the housing projects that would later get torn down within a couple of decades. So. All right, so that gives you kind of a quick overview. Um, but we can't really talk about all this without talking about Frank Lloyd Wright. So, you know, we, we talked about him as part of the arts and crafts movement and his prairie style. Uh, and these early modernists, they do not take in the lessons of the the design and decorations or whatever of the prairie style, but his work is highly influential because in 1910, he publishes what's known as the Vosmuth portfolio. So in 1909, I didn't get into this too much on our little walking tour, but in 1909, Wright packs up and he leaves almost overnight. He leaves Oak Park. He leaves his wife, he leaves his children, and he runs off to Europe with the wife of one of his clients. And in fact, the next slide here, uh, he runs off with Mrs. Cheney here. This is the Cheney house here in Oak Park. And he and Mrs. Cheney, uh, during the design uh, and construction of her house from 1903, um, became quite close, a little too close for, uh, for two married people. And they ran off to Europe. And um, while he was there, it pretty much destroyed his practice uh, in Oak Park and uh, more or less ends his prairie style era. But, um, but what it does is he publishes, he does this because he gets an offer by this uh, gentleman Wasmuth in Berlin to <coughs> publish a portfolio of his works. And it's published in 1910. And it has a hundred and uh, a hundred plates of these beautiful artistic renderings that he's working on. Um, actually, um, uh, Marion Mahoney, one of you, I uh, forget which one, but Mar one of you is studying Marion Mahoney or Mahoney. Um, people think it was really pronounced Mahoney. Um, she did a lot of these renderings um, and he took a lot of them with him and reused them in the Vosmuth portfolio. Here's a couple. This is the plate from uh, the portfolio of his home and studio. So we see the floor plan and the uh, sort of <laughs> elevation rendering here. And so uh, the architects, you know, this got published and it got spread around architecture offices. Mies van der Rohe talked about how he remembered seeing this in the office of Peter Behrens where he was working uh, around that time. And they looked at this and they thought, wow, we've never seen anything like this. Um, and especially when they saw things like Unity Temple and this, this geometric form and massing that it's built in, you know, pure concrete. There's, there's almost no decoration and ornament that's extraneous on here. Olof Luce would have almost liked this. Um, and they, they liked the planning, the organization, the way he sort of created these 
um, geometric pods and wings rather than creating one giant box that they had learned in their Beaux Arts training. Uh, and so this this is really what became really influential to them. They didn't necessarily copy it, but they 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 were inspired by the forms and the shapes and the direction and the planning that Wright was going. This is the Gale House. We saw this on our walking tour from 1909. Uh, finished just about the time he left. And so they saw this and they thought, wow, you know, this is stucco, but they would start to create this sort of thing in concrete and in stucco as well. And um, really like the, geomet the geometries and the massing of some of these um, some of these houses. So here, as we saw the Gale House on our walk there. And this is the Hurtley House. We saw this on our walk too. So here's the plan and the, the sort of rendering of that. And remember at the Hurtley House, this was in brick. Remember how he used different colors of brick and he really emphasized the horizontal lines. Um, well, initially we saw some early works that were not quite copies, but more direct influence, right? Right out of Frank Lloyd Wright. This is um, the Dr. Bejak House in Potsdam, just outside of Berlin from 1927 by Eric Mendelssohn. So this is, you know, 17 years after, this is quite a bit after the, the Vosmuth portfolio, but this is still a, a pretty direct link between Frank Lloyd Wright's prairie style work and these early modernists. Eric Mendelssohn was an early modernist um, uh, 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 protege or whatever. And so uh, we see, this is a black and white view. I'll show you a color one in a minute. It's a nice historic view. We see it spreading across the open landscape. We see the horizontal lines of the masonry. We see the sort of flat cantilevered roofs like we saw at the Gale House. All these different elements are right out of Frank Lloyd Wright, and they would have seen all of this in his Vosmuth portfolio. So this is um, uh, in a view of the house. I actually was really fortunate. Uh, in 2009, I was able to, to visit this house and meet with the owner. I'll show you in a moment, uh, Dr. Pitts or Mr. Pitts. He's a prominent uh, architect in Berlin um, that was very generous to give me a tour of his um, house that he restored here. Um, uh, so here's a few more details. You can see the the way Ed Mendelssohn on the left uses uh, a little bit different than the way Wright did it at the Hurtley House, but he really emphasizes the horizontal lines. We can see the bands of windows. Now he doesn't do art glass windows, um, so th that's one thing they get rid of. They're like, we don't need the art glass. That's extraneous. Uh, you know, but they liked the band of windows that let in light and views and vistas. Uh, incorporating nature here on the upper right, we see the, the sort of piers and the trellis of the garden element that really com unites nature and, and architecture, which is something that Wright was doing and was a huge goal of him. And this is Dr. Pitts here, uh, Mr. Pitts, the, the, the famous architect. Uh, he spoke no English <laughs> and I speak no German, you know, ja and nein uh, is about it. And uh, and so his daughter here um, had just come back from an immersion, English immersion program at Oxford. And she picked me up at the train station and said, well, I'm going to be your interpreter, except she's, you know, her English wasn't great and definitely wasn't architecturally focused. And so she's trying to interpret what her father is saying about architecture and design and all that. And it was funny because during this, I, I could kind of figure out what he was telling me before uh, his daughter Helena could actually interpret it for me. And she was struggling over the, some of the words and stuff. So it was a really interesting experience, but it was, it was an incredible thing to, to visit and see. Uh, here's another example out of Berlin. This is by the architect Bruno Taut, uh, the Schiller Park Estate. This is a, a housing complex um, out of World War I. Uh, after that, we saw a lot of um, new housing built in European cities uh, to alleviate uh, the, the housing shortages as more and more people were moving to cities in order to work in factories and businesses and so forth. Um, and of uh, Partly from the destruction, you know, not not so much in World War One were cities destroyed, but um, um, but still, you know, there was some destruction, and and we saw lots of these new housing complexes get built, uh, and these were meant to be, you know, better than the the overcrowded tenements that people had been living in. So we see balconies, we see buildings set in an open landscape with gardens around them and windows and views to those gardens so they can get fresh air, they can get fresh light and ventilation. Um, 
this is more of an apartment building and not a house, but you can still see some of the remnants of Frank Lloyd Wright in his prairie style on the horizontal banding here of the masonry and some of the banded windows and even some of the geometric massing that like what we saw at Unity Temple. Here's a couple of details of that uh, here at Schiller Park. Um, the, these balconies here and set like this, very much some of the massing really comes out of, of Wright uh, and his plates from the Voswith portfolio. All right, I think this is where a good point to leave off for the day.